afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to continue this segment on the event groups, and today we're going to be talking jumps. My name is Tatiana Grigorieva, and I'm currently working as a high performance advisor at QIS. I also run a pole vault squad uh, that allows me to continue my development as a coach. Um, I've got a pleasure to have on the panel today Alex Stewart, Paul Burgess, and Gary Bourne. Uh, can I please uh, ask you guys to introduce yourself quickly? Uh, Gary, can we please start with you? Okay, uh, my name is Gary Bourne. Um, I'm uh, a Victorian. I competed in Victoria for Box Hill Club uh, and I was a uh, state champion there over 448 in the 70s. Um, I moved to Queensland to do postgraduate studies. I had a Bachelor of Education in Phys Ed from Rosen. I came to Queensland to do a uh, um, master's degree, which I've won honours. Uh, and finished that in biomechanics in 1982. Um, so biomechanics is my, I guess, area of expertise in the sciences, although I have also quite a bit in the exercise physiology area. Um, I worked uh, at the uni. Uh, I taught track at Queensland University for two years full time. And then part the time I've worked there and taught that uh, for about another four or five years beyond that. Um, I'm uh, Currently, the head coach at the uh, Jump Centre at the Queensland Academy of Sport. Been there since 2010, so that's my 11th year uh, this year. Uh, I was formerly a, a physical education teacher, head of department in physical education, uh, a physical education consultant in the Brisbane South region. Uh, head of the Brisbane South region, I managed uh, school sport there. I'm former president of Queensland Athletics, former board member for Queensland uh, clubs and schools development. And uh, uh, yeah, that's pretty much my background. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Paul, can you uh, tell us a little bit a uh, little bit about yourself? Uh, yep, um, I'm Paul Burgess. I am coaching at the West Australian Institute of Sport. Um, I've been coaching since 2014. Um, I was an athlete before um, I retired in 2009. I was an Olympic pole vaulter. Um, and then I took a break from the sport completely and um, got back into it as an assistant coach to my previous coach, Alex Parnov. Um, and I, um, I was the, I was worked under him and learned a lot from him up until last year he left and I have taken over as the acting head coach. Um, which has been a really interesting challenge. Fantastic. Alex, uh, what about you? Uh, so my name is Alex Stewart. I am living in the northwest of Sydney and coaching mostly out of Sydney Olympic Park. Um, I was an athlete myself. I did triple jump um, and my greatest achievement was winning a bronze medal at a national championship level. Uh, I've now been coaching for 11 years and I started coaching because my wife was pregnant with our son and she had asked me to take over her group uh, and the rest is history essentially. Um, I have always essentially been a private coach and, and worked for myself and um, remain that way today. And been quite successful. Can I uh, can I just ask you to share with us uh, people that uh, you you worked in the past with or currently working with, Alex? Uh, um, so I currently coach Brandon Stark, who has jumped two meters thirty six, which is the equal national record. I also coach Eleanor Patterson. Uh, who has jumped 1 metre 99, which is the current women's national record. I have also coached um, a Malaysian high jumper by the name of Naraj Singh Randawa, who twice broke the Malaysian national record with performances of 2.29 and 2 metres 30. Fabulous. Paul, um, you know, you're working from Western Australia and it's uh, a bit of a hub for the pole vaulters, for Australian pole vaulters. Um, who, who are the athletes you're currently working with from a high performance? And also, I know you've got 
quite a big junior squad in Western Australia. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yep. So, um, I, I mean, obviously I was working over here with the elite pole holders basically from the beginning because I was working as an assistant coach to Alex through um, from the start. Um, and then last year, basically, I've taken them over. So that includes um, uh, Liz Parnov, who's an Olympian, um, Nina Kennedy, who's, you know, a world-class vaulter, Curtis Marshall, who's been an Olympian and, and one of the top vaulters in the world, and um, a couple of uh, guys coming through, Angus Armstrong and Declan Carruthers. They're the sort of the main core of the group. Um, yeah, we've had a history of pole vault over here. We've, you know, um, produced, you know, uh, Steve Hooker, who was the world uh, Olympic and world champion, Dmitry Markov, who was the world champion. We had Emma George here, who was um, a world record holder, and myself, who was a six metre jumper as well. So we've got a, a, a proud history of pole vault over here. Um, and yeah, we um, try to keep a, a junior group going all the time because, um, we need to keep producing, you know, results and keep producing talent. Um, so that's a big part. We really, and we're really even now trying to refine and improve the pathway um, program o over here. And yeah, we hope that we're, we're big on trying to push the development of pole vault around the country. Really, we really think pole vault, um, we have a good chance of doing well in. It's a technical event. Um, where we can match the rest of the world and, and we're a big um, supporter of keeping pole vault going as long as we can as a, one of our sort of strong events in Australia. Fantastic. You definitely sport to go to for pole vaulters for sure. Um, Gary, I'm a little bit uh, familiar with your group, but can you please tell us about the people you're currently working with and the experience you had uh, in the past, because uh, out of everybody who is involved into this conversation, you've got the most, ex I guess, extensive uh, coaching experience and career. Yeah, I won't go through the uh, whole list. Um, look, I've, I've coached uh, Mitchell Watt um, and Henry Frayne amongst the boys, Chris Nofke, uh, Robbie Crowther, and then Tim Paravasini toward the end of his uh, career, and also was involved with coaching. Uh, Philip Sado for a while when he came out from England. Amongst the girls, I had I coached Bonham Thompson, who was fourth in Athens in 2004. Nara Nang, who is the current 100 metre and uh, long jump champion. Uh, Gay Kaepernick, who was a 95 high jumper in, uh, in the 80s. Uh, and Chelsea Gents, who was Olympian here, who came here from uh, South Australia. Uh, those that are still there in that squad, I've got Frayne and Nang. Uh, who else is still there? Um, I've got uh, a couple of sprinters there as well. So I have uh, um, uh, uh, You've got quite a few juniors. So you've got Zane Branco who just I do, yeah, you I have from Zane Branco there. Yeah. I have, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, ben Smith. Um, I've got uh, Oscar Myers, uh, Annie um, uh, McGuire. Uh, yep. Jacinta trains with you as well. Uh, who uh, who ha Jacinta training with you as well? Who, who had a very good, well, yeah, yeah, is, uh, very good is, season. You know, the fastest one and two in the in the country last season. So I've taken on a few more sprinters because I have a bit of a technical focus in the in the running uh, stuff that I do, and uh, some of them have somehow migrated across, and uh, I guess benefited for some uh, uh, fixing up of technique and some other stuff. So, Nara and uh, Jacinta are amongst those. And I also yeah. have uh, Michelle Jenicky, of course, who's a uh, hurdler. Hurdles. Yeah, fabulous. With, with your current experience, uh, guys, I guess if there's one advice you can give to the coaches who are maybe considering to, you know, to, to get onto this pathway of development, um, what would this advice be, I guess, the biggest challenges you faced and uh, the lesson that you've learned? Um, you know, what what can you share with, with the coaches who are just entering the scene or at the very beginning of a development? Um, Paul, can we please ask uh, or start with you? Um, yeah, I would say um, for me, I had a couple of issues when I started coaching. One was um, maybe... I, I, 
understanding that being an athlete doesn't make you a good coach. <laughs> being, you know, so it's a completely different muscle that you work, I think, and you develop. Um, so that's something maybe my ego had to accept at first, and that was um, a good lesson to start with. Um, and the other thing is, is that one, one of the main things is understanding each athlete and their personalities and, and not, not expecting people to have the same sort of values as you. Um, and the same methods as you about, um, you know, being motivated or whatever. Some people, uh, everyone's different in how they get motivated and how they act motivated. Um, and I think just being accepting of every different personality that you're dealing with and, um, yeah, dealing with each person for who they are um, rather than trying to make them like you think they should be. Yeah, and I've I've seen you work, uh, you know, on day to day, I guess, in the training uh, training environment, and I've seen you um, in the environment of highest, uh, I guess, stage competitions at the World Champs. Uh, you extremely supportive of your athletes and very acceptable of who they are, and uh, you know, as you said, everybody's got different um, obstacles, different challenges they're dealing with. Um, I totally agree with you. I think it's important to to keep an eye on each individual and treat them um, according to what each of them, you know, needs. Mm. Uh, what about you, Alex? Uh, you work with Australian as well as the international athletes. Uh, um, what are the lessons? Um, so le lessons that I have learned, like on my journey of coaching so far have been probably from two main viewpoints. Um, I've been fortunate enough to coach um, a few athletes from a very young age um, to becoming adults. Um, the thing that I wasn't really prepared for in that scenario is that you, you have kids um, who are essentially willing to do anything that you tell them and over the years they become their own people with their own thoughts and views on how the world works um they get into relationships they become married they have kids um so the way that you can coach those people changes dramatically over the course of that time um that was difficult for me because um being young i really haven't had that much life experience to know how to deal with that easily. Um, so that's definitely been um, something very useful. Um, the other thing is having dealt with a few athletes from multiple, uh, multiple different countries, um, I've had to deal with athletes of different religions, um, learning how to respect those. Um, you know, I've had, had times where I think I turned up to the track one morning and said good morning in five different languages. Um, not to say that I'm proficient in five different languages, um, but it's certainly something that you try to take on board to make everybody feel welcome. So, yeah, try to be as accommodating as you can to the different individuals that you coach. Very important. Uh, I imagine the cultural differences uh, would play a big role. Uh, I'm originally coming from a different culture um, and uh, I know the differences between Russian culture and Australian culture in general and sport specific is massive. So being able to understand and being able to work within the acceptable parameters, I guess, for each of the um, individually, yes, um, very, very important. Gary, Gary, what about you? Uh, I'm sure you can teach all of us uh, a few tricks. Um, what what but, are uh, your biggest tricks, uh, takeaways? I, yeah, I guess the best piece of advice uh, that was ever given to me was given to me by Peter Bowman <clears throat> at the uh, Australian Institute of Sport. And he said, uh, I want you to coach one event area. So in uh, 90... 94 at the Commonwealth Games, I had three athletes in three different areas. Uh, I had previously coached athletes that represented Australia in every event from 100 metres to marathon, jumps, in the throws, uh, in the hurdles and in multi-events. So I'd coached a, such a wide group and people were just coming to me because 
I guess I had a biomechanics background. I was able to understand uh, and interpret a lot of the stuff and help people in little ways rather than in big ways and rather than uh, programs. Um, the next thing that uh, uh, I decided to do, so in 97, I stopped coaching at the end of the 97 season and I became president of Queensland Athletics and I said, I've had enough of coaching, I'm going to do some admin stuff and, and uh, uh, go back and, and do my teaching. I was head of the department and stuff. And then I, John Zafiraki, uh, who's a throws coach, uh, you remember John, uh, came to see me at my home in 2000, asked me if I would come back to coaching. Said, well, I'll only do it, if I'm gonna do it, I sat down and thought about it. I said, I'm only gonna do it if I'm gonna do it properly. Um, so I decided that I would stick to a very small number of athletes uh, in one event area, uh, and that I would really focus on getting to know everything I needed to know about that event area um, in order to coach in that, that way properly. So that are the, probably the two, you know, the two major lessons that uh, I learned from um, my early days. Learned a lot of lessons from athletes, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. I think from my experience uh, and as a coach, it's very important to continue developing and looking for the knowledge. Um, and I think uh, I've been very fortunate to, to be in the same state with Gary. Um, so having someone who can mentor and give an advice uh, is extremely important. I think, Paul, you, you kind of, you've been in a similar situation with Alex as well, when you had a mentor who, who would teach you and explain a lot of things, um, you know, that you can't read in the books. Um, so if, if anything, I think that that's an important uh, message from me to, to find someone who can give a bit of a guidance, whether it's within the technical model or within the approach and dealing with, a, with the athletes, super, super important. 100%. Well, all right, enough of the general intro. Can we get into the nitty gritty of the jumps? Uh, and uh, Gary, I would like to start with you because I'm very fond of uh, your approach to, to the technical models and, and the training in general. Can we talk a little bit more about, you know, technical models, I guess, that you're introducing and also uh, how you structure, what are you, uh, what are you putting into the week training for your athletes? Uh, what methods are you using? Okay, in, in um, um, I guess my technical model for my for jumping, uh, essentially I just went about what it is that uh, was needed to be successful in this event uh, or these events at international level. Um, and so, you know, I came down to things like uh, velocity on the runway, max velocity, the the uh, velocity the transition to take off, what the transition to take off looked like, what the penultimate position looked like, take off position looked like, uh, the sorts of strength levels that were required in order to be able to um, manage those sort of positions and uh, you know, those things that looked at the technical model for running um, and how we should, uh, how I would go about developing that. So there's lots of smaller things that too much to, go through here, but you know, I guess uh, um, you know, the essential thing in horizontal jumping is speed, because that in, you're a projectile in, in horizontal jumping, in all jumping, um, when the athlete leaves the ground. And so um, the athlete to be a projectile, the, the thing that makes the greatest difference to distance for a projectile is the speed at which it leaves, it, speed of release or the speed at which the jumper leaves the ground. So that makes a huge difference. Uh, it's something, it's, common, it's accountable for something like 56% uh, change in, in a, uh, a jump, also 56 centimetres change in a jump at about seven metre distance um, when you increase the speed by 5%. Uh, if you increase the angle of 5%, uh, uh, you get about 12 or 13 centimetres. And if you increase the height take off you get about three centimeters or the same thing applies to the height of landing so they are the things so that then leads me into how i would address training i, I would uh, start to focus my training and generating or maximizing this speed on the runway 
beats and minimising the speed loss that they may have in the transition to takeoff. Um, those rules I apply across both uh, horizontal jumps, so I apply them across long jumping and triple jumping. So I used to be big into the bounding uh, uh, side of things, uh, most of the European model for triple jumping. I tended to move away from that and I've seen, uh, tended to see uh, triple jumping more as triple jumping, uh, uh, more triple jumping in training and less bounding, uh, which is, uh, you know, the bounding is still important and we still do some of it, uh, but we do more actual triple jumping in training at very increases in uh, speed uh, to be able to manage that sort of speed and maintain that speed through all the phases. I think Jonathan Edwards was the one in triple jump who led the way in, in that area. Um, and uh, we've got the same thing, uh, current uh, crop of triple jumpers in the world. The Americans both are uh, very fast on runway and both their speed, uh, loss of speed through the transition in, in each of the jumps. Um, can, can you give us an example how you're structuring your weekly training? So we've got Monday to Sunday. Uh, what would um, a training session look like for, um, you know, your high performance athletes, whether it's now or Henry or Zane, um, Jacinta? It can vary a little bit across the season, but it doesn't vary very much. I, I, I work on two three-day cycles. So, I, again, uh, I prioritise my jump. The athletes, that's the most important thing for them. So Monday is the jump session. So Sunday is a rest day. Monday okay. is a jump session and it's, uh, it's a major jump session and involves uh, most, it's either the long jumping or the triple jumping. And it's also uh, supplemented with standing jumps or bounds, uh, some shot throws, uh, you know, maybe some jumps over, some other hurdles and that sort of things or jumps as well. Uh, Tuesday or the second day of the training week this is gym and my gym programs uh, I use uh, heavyweight exercises along with a, a bunch of uh, supplementary exercises and some jumps, uh, box jumps into that as well so both gym exercises both gym sessions for me are the same I don't vary the exercises between uh, sessions I know some people do that but uh, that's just my uh, exercise physiology, uh, physiology of strength training view of the world. So a lot of the stuff I do is very uh, entrenched in, in the science approach. Um, Wednesday we run. So we run somewhere between 900 and 1200 metres. And that'll be made up of 120s, 100s, 90s, uh, sometimes of the year. And maybe using sleds and vests and stuff in combination with those runs. And those runs decrease in distance as we get further down into the, toward the competition uh, end of the season. Uh, but we used about 1,200 metres worth of running as the base. And that's, that's most, more than many sprinters do, um, I know. And uh, uh, we do most of our running in that intensity of between uh, 90 and 95%. Although the Saturday running session, which is the second running session of the week, is often it can become a recovery day and it's usually done at tempo at 80%. But if the athletes are fine and they're coping with training, then they're doing stuff at 90 and 95%. So the remainder of the training week, so we basically go, have got jump, gym, and then run. And the, base, the rest of the training week is similar. So it's jump, gym, and then run again. Um, but these are minor, tend to be minor sessions. So the second jump session is a minor session and I'll modify it according to how the athletes brought up from the first session. They may not do anywhere near as much jumping. They may in fact not do any jumping on that day if they haven't pulled up very well or they haven't recovered from the earlier stuff in the week. They may be doing tempo on that day instead. So you need to, I guess, uh, manage and monitor um, what's going on in your uh, training amongst the athletes to be able to uh, manage the load for those athletes and every athlete is different. Uh, is the same and running is usually longer for us on the Saturday um, and it's usually 120s and sometimes even 150s uh, and there will be somewhere anywhere between six and, and nine or ten of those depending on the athlete, depending on their stage of training um, and they're generally done at a little bit slower, somewhere 80 to 90 percent. Mm -hmm. jumpers, it's, it's fairly similar. Um, they have a little bit more bound in the second uh, jump session, 
I did triple jumping in the first one, uh, mainly. Um, did a little bit of bounding and other shot throws, various other things, but the second jump session is, is uh, involves things like, it may involve multi-bounds on the grass at some times of the year, uh, such as the early stage of the year, which some of the athletes are doing at the moment. Um, and there's a focus on ground contacts and technical models in all of the stuff that we do. So we have a major focus on the way people do things, not just what they're doing them, what they're doing rather, because it's the way they do them, which is, why they do these things, which is uh, critical to, you know, both uh, succeeding in the event and also avoiding injuries and stuff. So. Well, uh, Gary mentioned that speed for jumps, uh, you know, if we're looking at a general overview, speed for horizontal jump is one of the main components. Um, Alex, when, when you're looking at the junior high jumper um, who got an aspiration to become, you know, Brendan Stark um, down the track, what are the qualities you're looking for in the high jump and what are the qualities that will be important to develop uh, for for an athlete, so they can have a long and successful career in the high jump. Well, so we've just heard Gary talk a, a lot of about how he places a strong emphasis on running ability to run well, um, and that remains true in a high jump from my perspective. Um, I like to I like to see kids, I like to see young high jumpers that can generally run well. Um, and it's important, um, as simple as it might sound, for young high jumpers to be able to run well repeatedly in a straight line. I mean, that's the, the base level that you have to start with. If you can do that, then you have a chance to be able to run well around a curve. Um, all, in, all in good time, of course, um, because Many people might see the way Brandon does his approach run now, um, and maybe they think it's quite impressive because it is. I mean, he is quite quick for a high jumper, but that's a number of years that it's taken for him to get to that point. Um, other things that I look for for young high jumpers is multiple, like they need to have a broad range of skills. Um, I'm not a fan of one-dimensional high jumpers. Um, I like to see kids that compete in other, jump, other jumping events. I like to see kids that do hurdling, um, you know, maybe even throwing. Um, primary reason for that is, well, <laughs> jumps in general is about rhythm. So you want to have kids that have got a good understanding of rhythmic capacities. Um, kids that understand maybe just naturally they understand the angles they understand how to project things um, moving on from that um, the way that i try to to develop kids um, i like to take a, a very like multi-planar approach um, of course we do a lot of circle drills um, we'll do stuff in both directions um, so we might just have normal circles and using whatever drills that we use, um, both directions, making figure eights, um, snaking type runs. Um, basically, I think it's best just to have a, like a very broad approach and try and develop like a real large cross section of abilities for young athletes. Totally agree. Uh, for someone like Brendan, um, how would you start, uh, structure his weekly training? Uh, what does the week consist of for him? Uh, so Brandon's week um, looks like, so Monday is a, a technical day. Um, so depending on the time of the year will do, depend on, on what specifically that is, but usually there will always be some kind of work on a run up. It may not always be a run up to a map with a takeoff. Um, it could be just a run up away from the upper flights of the mats um, or it could be just a rhythm exercise on the bench. Uh, so there'll be a run-up component and then there'll be a takeoff or a bounding component. 
the Tuesday is a gym day. Uh, in the gym, we tend to stick to kind of very fundamental exercises, uh, clean, hang clean, snatch, hang snatch, uh, squat, step up. And then we'll have a number of supplementary exercises which will support that, but we tend not to deviate too much away from those fundamental lifting exercises. Uh, Wednesday will essentially be a recovery from the first two days of the week. Um, may involve some longer running, I say longer, um, 80, maybe up to 150 metres. Uh, the intensity rest will purely depend on the state of the athlete. Um, but we'll also throw in some some med ball stuff, some hurdle mobility, uh, just a, a very general part day. Uh, usually on on the Wednesday as well, Brandon will get um, a massage as well. Um, he'll try and have a massage before his rest day. So his rest day um, on the Thursday is purely rest. Mm -hmm. so, body's not undergoing any stress. Uh, the Friday is our second technical day. And again, depending on the time of year, um, depends on what we do, but the structure of the session is quite similar to that of the Monday session. Um, and then Saturday will be another gym day. And so across the, across the week, we tried to like find some repeatability within the activity. So there's some common themes occurring. Um, so we can really try and make sure that the athletes get a good grasp on any skill that they're trying to work on. Very good. Um, Paul, um, I've got a soft spot. There's uh, probably you as well for, for Paul Vault. Um, and uh, I think this event sits, uh, you know, sits aside from a jumps and some of the qualities that Alex and Gary just mentioned uh, are requirements for long triple jump as well as the high jumpers. Uh, pole vaulters need to top it up. Um, what, what are the qualities besides, uh, you know, the speed and the quality of the execution or, you know, running movements? What else would you look for um, in the athlete? Well, obviously, that's still part of it. So their run, their speed. But I, I think um, running mechanics and natural running mechanics, when you see them as kids, you sort of see the kids that are just fast, but they've got terrible running style or kids that are fast and they sort of run really well and naturally. Um, and because generally, I think what you need is kids that have good coordination and feel and they're able to feel instinctively how to find the right positions. Um, and then, you know, that, as you said, sort of Alex, something like that, you know, that they uh, intuitively know angles and stuff like that. Um, and I think it's much the same. And it's kids that can do, you know, they're really good at hopscotch skipping, you know, all that, all that sort of like um, coordination based stuff. Um, and then you'd also like them ideally to have some um, ability to as a gymnast, even if they haven't done gymnastics, they can still do handstands and cartwheels and swing on a bar and have have basic good feel. And because I think a lot of the time in pole vault, you want them to be able to feel for the, the sweet spot, you know, and, and, and you can see some of the guys, like I, I'd say Nina Kennedy, who's one of the vaulters in our group. I remember seeing her when she just started pole vaulting and, you know, she's one of those athletes that is all instinct. So, you know, within a couple of months of vaulting, she just could, she could aim for the, it's almost like you just say to her, aim for the sweet spot and she can find it after a few jumps. Um, so that, that, those are the qualities. Also, I guess generally, you know, you look for taller, you know, um, people that are reasonably tall, but there's always exceptions to these rules. You know, you're like, you know, now there's like the villain, he's not very tall and he broke the world record. and. And things like that. So some or all of some or all of those qualities is what we look for. Mm. Yeah. Um, for for somebody who is uh, planning or structuring the week, um, and I would like probably to touch base on uh, principles of training. How often uh, would you advise to to jump? To do a technical session, and you all mentioned um, that you wouldn't jump 
probably more than uh, three times a week, but what is the minimum? What is the maximum? What are your thoughts around it? Um, Paul, can we start with you, please? How often would you vault with your guys? Well, the senior guys, I find, you know, basically twice a week is enough. Um, and even at there's times when early in the season, I don't do, like, you know, in really early general prep, I don't even do my, any vaulting. I give them a break from that because their technique is quite established. I find that is, they can have a break for a while, come back, and they vault exactly as they left. So they've, they've, it's so instilled in them that they don't lose much and you're able to work on some other things. So I guess at different times of the year, I've prioritised different things. And at certain times, vaulting is, say, not part of it, then vaulting might become part of it, but it's not the priority. You know, like as in, at the moment, we're more focused on improving some of the physical attributes of the athletes and doing some pole vault stuff, but it's, it's not the main focus of the, of the training block. And then at different times, um, you know, pole vault becomes the sort of uh, the key part of the, of the, you know, pole vault technique becomes the key part of what we're working on. Um, but pretty much all the time, two times a week is what I go for. Um, with kids, I think just, um, you know, teach their, the sessions should be putting a pole in their hand as often as possible, teaching them basic running, running drills, plyos, you know, um, things like that, and then just, putting a pole in their hand and, and getting them familiar and comfortable holding a pole. So that could be two or three times a week. Um, as many times as they want, they're pretty resilient. You can just let them play a lot of the time. Yeah, that's probably the best way to, to get a little one involved into the sport, um, keep it fun. Um, Alex, for you, how often do you need it? Uh, it, it is necessarily to, to jump, to establish a certain, um, I guess, technical model? Uh, well, we will never jump more than twice a week. Um, and when I say the jump, I can might refer to it might be high jump from a full approach, or it could be takeoff drills, over hurdles, or general pounding. But there there won't be more than two jump days in a week. Um, generally. If we're talking about Brandon, for example, he won't high jump more than once a week. Um, for him, jumping is quite stressful on his body. Um, and also for his style of jumping, um, it's also emotionally difficult to try and jump often. Um, there, there's been times within his training where we've gone two, three weeks without jumping, um, and that's okay, but mostly due to his training age. Like, he is able to step away from high jump for a little while and come back to it. Um, and during the time when he's not jumping, there's still, there's still a common theme occurring throughout the training program, which we can relate to actual high jumping in itself. Gary, your thoughts around it? Yeah, I, I agree with Alex, um, um, you know, that once uh, you've established a basic technical model with a jumper, then they're not going to forget how to high jump and it's not the end of the world if they can't high jump for uh, a period of time. Um, generally, the rule around principles of training is somebody needs to do something generally twice a week if it's in the development phases in order to be able to change things so I'm not talking about a senior athlete I'm talking about a development level athlete uh, generally one to two a week uh, two is preferable uh, ahead of one I would agree with both Paul and Alex uh, you know and I'd like to highlight the importance of general skills development and coordination amongst our young athlete population so for coaches that have young athletes in their group um, this is, you know, having not necessarily directly related activities to that event that you're trying to coach, but having lots of coordination, drills and activities, throws, jumps, running, uh, hurdling, those sort of things in a program is enormously important to a young athlete's development. Early, spe early specialization causes a lot of problems for athletes. 
Uh, so I think those uh, that those sort of things are, are uh, in, important. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of the uh, principles of training, they are specificity. So anything that you're doing needs to, if you're dealing with senior athletes, it needs to be fairly specific to the event that you're trying to train for, the activity you're training for. Uh, and then beneath that, you sit with things like overload and overload is important, but it's, just, it's not, it's not never ending overload, uh, as anyone um, of these guys would tell you as well. Um, and so that you, you're looking at things like volume, intensity, duration, uh, that stuff, and also diminishing return. And I manage load through my program uh, through managing those things. So my first priority is technical proficiency. Um, and that comes through the junior ranks and general athletic uh, skills and development. Uh, and then overload, I manage those things, but I never increase uh, uh, sprinting intensity by more than 5% in any one week. Um, and then I don't increase intensity and volume ever in the, in the same week or at the same time. So you shouldn't you be careful how you do that. And there's lots of things that affect uh, intensity uh, as well. So moving from running in flats to running in spikes, just a big step up in intensity uh, of the load in the, in the calf region. So you need to be careful of that. Uh, doing any sort of jumps, uh, as you increase the speed, it's much greater load on uh, quads, hemis, quads in particular, and a patella tendon especially, uh, maybe Achilles. Uh, and so therefore you need to how you do that. And so we would do that and tell you just roughly, so there's a guide for young coaches, a four stride uh, approach. We manage the intensity in the jumps by managing the speed of approach because we uh, did a study at the AIS a couple of years back. We took a lot of jumpers there and, and tested these things or measured them. Four strides is about 60% of your maximum runway speed. Six strides is 80% of your maximum runway speed. 10 strides is 90%. 14 strides is 95% and 20 strides is, of course, your, your max run up. So if you then go jump off those approach speeds of four strides, six strides, 10 strides and 14 strides, then they are the way that the intensity or the load, the forces in the takeoff increase. So you know, you're, you're starting off at about 60% standing and four stride jumps and then you're at 80%. Uh, your, your maximum forces uh, with six stride and your 90% by the time you get to 10. Um, so managing those things and taking care how you manage those uh, is, is really important. Um, Gary, you mentioned intensity um, and we've got, we're just coming out from a lockdown. Um, I know in Queensland, we only gained an access uh, back to the Tartan track last week. Um, and that's probably the situation all around Australia as well. A lot of athletes, uh, senior, junior, very keen to get back on the track. Um, what are the risks involved, in your opinion, uh, from transitioning from the grass to the track? And you've mentioned intensity changing from shoes into spikes, Gary. Um, uh, your, your view, uh, what sort of a measures need to be taken or put in place to ensure or to minimise the risk of transition onto the track from a grass? Most of mine are senior athletes, and, and I, could, I could say to you, moving from grass that they have been running on, on football grounds and parks and various facilities like that, to running on the um, infield at uh, CUSAC uh, is quite a step up in hardness of the surface. And so I've stayed I'm doing the first three weeks of training on the grass. So that's adapting from having run on the grass in parks where it's been quite soft in many cases maybe a little bit uneven and the running has been perhaps a touch slower uh, to running on the middle. So we're doing about three weeks on the grass and then my uh, standard protocol moving from uh, grass to, to track is to do one set of a, uh, so if they're doing three sets of a nine reps of running in a session. Uh, they'll do one set on one day on the, the track and they'll do one set on the next day they run following week they'll move to two sets on the grass sorry on the track in the, in their flats and then on to uh, the third week they're in up at three sets on the grass so we're looking then at another uh, two to three weeks to move from 
uh, infield on the grass to the track and flats. And we have the same protocol, or very similar protocol in moving from uh, flats to spikes. So we move that uh, per, and it's usually the last set in the, in the training set uh, on a particular day. So maybe uh, two sets of three on the track in flats and then last set they'll do in spikes. Um, because if you do it as a first set, sometimes a bit of tightening up that happens and they've got to run the next two sets anyway, uh, or they will run the next two sets in flats and they've often um, and then you start, you may finish up with a problem. So uh, it's about total five or six weeks total to move from uh, track to grass in flats to fully on uh, track in spikes. Okay. Alex, what was your situation, uh, you know, in the last eight, eight weeks? Um, have you had much access to the track with your athletes? And if not, uh, what are your views around transitioning back on the track? Um, well, we've been fortunate that a number of councils in Sydney laid synthetic football pitches. Um, so they're quite easily accessible. Um, while they tend to be a little bit soft, um, at least we know that they're completely flat. Uh, so that's been pretty advantageous to the training we've done. Um, and it's pretty suitable to the, the training that we're doing at this time of year. And I'm probably talking more so about the younger athletes in, in general preparation as well. Um, probably I'd be a little bit similar to Gary um, in returning to the track in it needs to be very progressive. Um, I think it, it's not just a, a lockdown COVID-19 um, transfer period that we need to be mindful of. I think it's something that coaches need to be mindful of always. Right. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, you know, it's like, it, it's a way to manage your load. Look at the footwear you use. Transition in a smart and logical manner. Um, and that doesn't mean to once you're in spikes that you have to stay in spikes all year. Mm. Not all of your training needs to be done in spikes every session. Yep. Um, you know, you can, you can save your body. Um, you can save your parents some money as well by not wearing out your footwear as quickly. Uh, jump spikes are expensive. Um, high jump also we have to consider... You know, I talked earlier about doing things in multiple directions and snaking patterns and, and figure eights and so on and so forth. Um, transferring from, from grass to track or whether it's synthetic pitches to the track, make sure that you've done all that stuff um, for a significant period before you start to go on high jump. Um, also, even if you do start the high jump, monitor the, the number of jumps that you do. Don't go to the track and, and do 15 jumps off a full approach. Um, be smart, be logical about the progression. Well, with you, uh, as many other coaches, uh, I suppose uh, you would have a period in the year when you wouldn't even come close to the track. So as, as Alex said, that's not only the matter or the question of COVID. It's pretty much an ongoing and annual um, transition from the grass to the track. How you approach um, this transition, how you ensuring your athletes are, um, you know, I guess not uh, sustaining any, any injuries when transitioning onto the track. Um, I think basically I just concur with both of what Gary and Alex just said and pretty much have the exact same view. You monitor carefully and you do one step at a time. Um, you know, you increment, small increments in, in load and, um, and just making sure you're smart about that. You just, you, you bite off more than you can chew and, and you get sort of, uh, it's not surprising if you do that, that you're gonna get some injuries and things like that. Um, I think with this COVID uh, situation, what uh, it happened to me, you know, we set the athletes up with a weight set up at, at their homes um, and the, so they basically were doing, a, a, we had a, a Olympic bar, plates and squat rack and, you know, had to make do with that and make, get creative with programs. Um, and so we just did weights three times a week and running twice a week, um, you know, on, they'd find a, a 
a grass field and a, and a hill. Um, and they did that. Um, it was a good thing for me to let them uh, control things for a while and give them some independence. Um, for me to let go of some control probably. Um, and um, yeah, it was also a good lesson for me in, in sort of letting go of the things I can't control. Um, and I sort of found that quite, um, quite enjoyable in the end is to sort of see that they're gonna be okay. Um, and then we've just been slowly transitioning back. It's been really, uh, I think it's, it's been good having the break and letting them have, have some independence for both them and me. Um, and I think as well, it's a long, it's a long, we're planning for December when the sort of qualification periods open up again. So I think it's a long time to be in each other's pockets and in each other's faces and stuff. So I'm sort of um, grateful for the time um, that we had considering the situation. Yeah. Well, um, I hope it's uh, not the only opportunity we will have to talk about jumps uh, because that was just the general, I guess, overview of, uh, uh, you know, pole vault, high jump, triple and long. I hope we will have an opportunity to go a little bit more into the details and uh, I, I know you, you've got plenty of knowledge to share. But for today, uh, I would like to thank everybody um, for your time and for sharing this knowledge. Um, and uh, I hope to see everybody um, sometime soon when the borders are open and uh, we're able to compete again. Thanks, Tatiana. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Tatiana. Thanks. Thank Hello, you. Alex.